visible to everybody. So we want to increase visibility uh, to the community on what's going on with Shannon now as we're approaching uh, the new year. Uh, in addition, um, you know, the team is working on some stuff that is actually pretty slick and we wanted a forum to be able to have uh, core team members and other contributors show up and actually start showing off some of this stuff because in addition to being you know kind of like proud of the project like um i think a lot of that usually in from an engineering circles kind of goes back to like well what's the team building and are other teams building off of that and like are they you know, contributing something to sort of the web three, like sort of the ecosystem more broadly. And it turns out that we very much are doing some of that. Um, so we need to kind of like talk about that more. Uh, and then, you know, obviously like an educational component, like we want to, um, we want to get everyone in the community starting to really think about Shannon, what that looks like. And um, as, as people are thinking about tips and other features that they would like to have or uh, other things that, that adding to the ecosystem um, would help with like like it's time to start you know kind of shifting our mindsets over to the new roll up um, and thinking about okay what would that look like there um, versus just like let's build it on Morris and you know maybe we'll drag it over eventually so uh, yeah we want to start thinking Shannon first going forward that said um, oh hey ads um, thanks for joining I have a, I have a quick question actually because um, uh, Zach's not here I, I, I can't seem to share my um, my, my agenda uh, into this channel, it's blocking me. I don't know if that's yeah. like a, a setting. Okay, is that I something have no that, that you have the ability to <laughs> I'm frantic change? I'm okay. different menus. <laughs> so if anybody knows how All to right. do it, tell me. And otherwise, I will spatter around and hopefully find it. Okay, yeah. I, There's a place that has um, Okay, so um, in terms oh, I of can't more stream updates. Into this channel either. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I think um, it has to do with, I know we're moving a lot more stuff into Discord and I think yeah. maybe just a channel permissions got reset. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at. Okay, I'll just read off um, what people cannot see from the agenda, but the, the agenda was basically going to be, we're gonna do a quick like five minutes on, um, on Morse updates. Uh, then we're gonna talk about Shannon a little bit and then I'm gonna hand things over to Harry, who's on the call, he's on the core dev team. And he's going to talk about the SMT and some of the cool stuff that he's um, he's been working on personally. Um, so without further ado, because we're already 10 minutes in, we're just going to jump right to the Morse updates. Uh, so the Coder 3 team um, has been targeting this week starting December 11th uh, as the date for the sort of last Morse update. They'll be, they're still working on their two main PIPs that were approved. Uh, I believe it's 34 and 30. Three, um, and so those will be made available. Um, there are there's a brand new team uh, that is now maintaining Morse testnet. Uh, the handoff was successful from Node Fleet, uh, and uh, actually, as we said in the community call, um, thanks to them for helping facilitate that. Uh, but now we've got a maintainer crew of uh, four individual entities, um, so it is. You can consider this our decentralized testnet at this point. Uh, and they will receive uh, the, the next Morse release, which will be the last Morse release. Um, sometime that week, still working it out, exactly. Um, and they will upgrade testnet. And then we'll basically go into our sort of end of the year freeze. Um, and they'll just let it bake. Uh, through that and then we'll show up back in January and then we will uh, essentially schedule in the last mainnet upgrade. So that'll take place like, you know, mid-Jan is sort of our target for that. Okay, on the Shannon side, um, the end-to-end -end relay is uh, is looking good. Uh, the claim and proof is looking good. Uh, Mint burn is in progress. Um, we have two other threads that are 
related to engineering but are non-engineering. One of them is a sequencer selection. So uh, moving to a rollup means that we now require the use of a sequencer, which is you can think of sort of in the same way you would think of a validator. Uh, the sequencer has to build blocks. The difference being, and the reason why they're called sequencers and not validators, is they do not validate the transactions in them. That's up to the app chain after. Uh, and this is the sort of shift uh, that Celestia and, and DA layer modularity sort of brings to the table, um, is that you just, they're agnostic to um, the validity of transactions. Again, they leave that up to the applications. Um, what they uh, what they're obsessed with, though, is uh, ordering and then uh, availability, right? So the sequencer is the piece that is responsible for bundling and delivering to the DA layer and and making sure that ordering uh, is correct uh, and then writing that to the DA layer. Um, so as we think about that, um, we had some options. One of those options is we build a sequencer ourselves. Um, team didn't want to do that. Uh, secondly, um, so what we're doing instead is we actually uh, sent out RFPs to multiple teams that are working on um, sequencers as a service uh, and different teams are approaching that in slightly different ways. Um, some where the solutions are more centralized right now, others that are pushing towards, uh, you know, uh, highly decentralized setups and, and other teams are kind of like somewhere in between. So we're look, um, we, we have all of these responses back from Caldera, from Astria, from Espresso Systems, everyone that's sort of um, got their hat in the ring, and we're reviewing all of those proposals and uh, against the criteria that we had. Uh, and then what will happen is that we will be making essentially a recommendation to the DAO as to like uh, the team that we would like to work with. Um, and we're organizing ourselves to have that call tomorrow, uh, and then you know we'll fast follow with uh, with a forum post out to the community around that and, and explain it, and then uh, with our recommendation on who we should go with, um, and then as soon as we make that decision, then that sort of frees up the engineering teams to be able to start to engage and work together, and et cetera, et cetera. So we're super excited. Um, this is a main main piece that we needed to get solved. Uh, so we're 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 pretty close. So that's going good um, and then the other final thread uh, that I'll mention on Shannon right now is uh, we're also lining up some audits that we need to get done um, the first one being SMT which you're about to hear about uh, but the other related to like wrap pocket so everybody's super excited about um, how well wrap pocket has been received uh, well so one of the things we'll need to do is think about well how are we going to migrate um, the wrap pocket bridge to the roll-up and you know still have that um, that bridge back to Ethereum. So uh, we're, we're approaching that in several ways as well. Same thing, uh, same sort of same concept for the sequencer selection is where um, we've got uh, an RFP document that we've worked on for that migration. Um, and we're, we're sending that out to some teams to get feedback. One of those teams being Raid Guild, who actually built the original Wrap Pocket, um, but some other teams as well, just to be, um, you know, just to get more opinions on what it should look like. Um, and then we will do the same, follow the same pattern where we will vet those responses, we will make a recommendation to the community in the DAO uh, and put that to vote. And then once it does, then that will be the path forward. But um, those are in the works uh, right now. Cool. Any questions on either of those topics before we uh, we hand it over to Harry? Sorry, not on those topics, but Harry, are you able to screen share now? I know that I now can. Yeah, it, sa it says that I can. So um, Amazing. we'll see in a moment oh, great. when I start sharing. Oh, fingers crossed. Okay, wait, let's, let's, let's see if I can. One, two, three. Yeah, I heard up during last time. So, okay, perfect. So you guys can now actually see the. Uh, so, okay, awesome. Um, all right, yeah. So that's what we just wrapped up, and here's where we are now. Okay, uh, so I'll stop sharing, and then Harry can share unless you're.
Can everyone see my screen now? We can indeed. Okay, perfect. So as um, right, Mateo away. just mentioned, I, uh, I'm about to talk about the SMT. So just a little, little primer on me. Um, I work on the protocol team building the Shannon upgrade. I don't really touch the V0 or Morse code base much. I have in this last month or so, but my main areas of focus are the SMT itself, which is like its own repo, uh, as well as compute units, which tie in very well to the SMT. And we'll discuss this a little bit later, as well as other things such as the gateway and uh, ring signatures, as well as a lot of other different bits and pieces. If you're following the code updates, you'll see that I kind of uh, post a lot of uh, uh, code for different areas of the standard protocol. So let's dive into what we're talking about today. So the SMT or sparse Merkle tree, it was formerly developed by Celestia. So they started the project, however, they archived it. Um, however, we were using it in the previous uh, protocol repo. So the old V1 repo. Um, for our state storage, so we decided to take it over, and I lead the development on that, and I have since the, well, coming up for a year now. Um, in that time, we've added lots of features, and recently, actually, we've learned that it's being used outside of Popped. So uh, for anyone who knows about IOTA, IOTA Ledger, they're actually using the SMT repo. Um, they submitted their first PR recently which got me super excited to see this this uh, this uh, baby of mine almost take its first steps um, into the industry. Um, but I guess this raises a few main questions for anybody who is not super familiar with Merkle trees and, and what they do, what they're used for. Um, so we'll go through these three questions here on the screen. What are Merkle trees? What makes ours sparse? And what are they used for? So just to give a quick uh warning we're going to be discussing this at a higher level i tried to not go into too much technical detail i had a completely different slide deck prepared for the uh protocol team when i introduced them to the smt however um that was very technical lots of code samples um and it took a very long time to go through and explain everything so we're going to be going through things at a higher level today so what are merkle trees the best way to think about Merkle trees is just through this picture here on the right. So we have a tree-like structure, as you can see, built with uh, what we would call different nodes. And these represent basically a key value database. So at the bottom here, we see L1, L2, L3, L4. These would represent our key value pairs. And what makes a Merkle tree a Merkle tree is that each node is the hash of its children. So in this diagram on the right, we can see at each level, we take the hash of the previous uh, level. So the hash of this node here on the bottom left is the hash of L1. The node above it is the hashes of these two added together, and then you hash the sum. And then this root, this goes all the way up to the, the top hash, which is what we would refer to as the root hash or the Merkle root of a Merkle tree. The reason that we use these in blockchains in specific is because they provide excellent abilities to verify the integrity of the data that they store. If any of the key values change, it changes the ultimate top hash or root hash. And you'll see these in every blockchain where they store state. So Bitcoin, if you read the Bitcoin paper, they introduced the topic of Merkle trees. I'm pretty sure the Bitcoin white paper has a very similar diagram to this on the right, if not the same one. And then every single blockchain afterwards has copied that and has used them in slightly different ways. Um, and another amazing thing that Merkle trees provide is the ability to prove or the inclusion or exclusion of a certain key value pair in the tree. So you can either say for certain whether this key is or is not in the tree uh, with a specific value. And to move on to the next slide, why we talk about 
sparse. It's quickly just a, while we have this diagram here on the, the right, it's good to understand that this is what we would call a complete or balanced Merkle tree, which means that every level of the tree has the maximum number of nodes. So each node has, in this case, two children. So what makes ours sparse? So as you can see from the diagram on the right, it looks very different to the one we had on the previous slide. So a sparse Merkle tree is a Merkle tree that is not complete, i.e. we do not have a full set of nodes at each level of the tree. In fact, we have what we would call default or placeholder nodes or values. So in this diagram, we see the nodes that are represented as zero, these would be placeholder values. And the benefit of using a sparse tree over a complete tree is that you can represent a vast yet sparsely populated data set. So think about all the different possible wallets or addresses that you could have, and each of them could have a balance. However, when we get to it, the majority of wallets don't exist. They haven't been created and they have no balance. So if we wanted to create a Merkle tree that represented the, the entire um, wallet space, like which wallet has what balance, using, using a complete Merkle tree would result in a huge data structure, a huge tree with, which has a large number of key value pairs at the bottom that have nothing in them. However, with a sparse tree, we can use this sparsely populated data set and compact it into a much more efficiently stored form. And this is the main advantage of using a sparse Merkle tree. So it's easier to traverse the tree, it's a lot faster to generate proofs, to get values. Um, and overall, this increase in performance is uh, the main reason why we use them. So Ethereum uses a sparse Merkle tree, and I'm sure pretty much every other project does in the modern sense. Unfortunately, the Cosmos ecosystem does not use a sparse Merkle tree. They use what is called an IAVL tree. But one of the long-term goals for our SMT is to get it put as the default tree in the Cosmos ecosystem, which would be a major win for us, seeing as we use the Cosmos SDK to build our roll-up at the moment. It would be a huge optimization to, uh, to get this at the the ground floor, essentially. And before we move on to the final question that we had earlier, what are we using it for? We need to talk about some of the features that we've added because these features are essential to our use case in particular. So lazy loading being the first BR that we pushed into the SMT repo. This is essentially means that when we go about loading the tree we only load what we actually need we don't load the entire thing that's why it's called lazy loading and this is a huge performance increase and then the second point here is the sparse Merkle sum tree so we're going to discuss this in the next slide but this is a essentially a wrapper around the smt itself which allows for a computation of the total sum of the tree don't worry about what that means just now. We will dive into that um, on the next slide, as I said. And then finally is a novel proof mechanic or like a new proof mechanism, which we developed quite recently, which is essential to the claim and proof lifecycle. So now that we understand what we've added to the SMT, we know at a high level what the SMT is. We can talk about how we're using it in Shannon. So we're not actually using the SMT, but we're using the sparse Merkle sum tree because the SMT is more a generalized tree for state storage. However, the SMT, uh, the SMST, sorry, or sparse Merkle sum tree allows us to calculate a sum of the tree. So basically, the nodes in a session, what we would call now suppliers, each of them will, as they go through the session, insert into their SMST the relay as well as the weighting of that relay. 
This is where compute units come in. So the weighting of the relay is essentially the cost or the work done for executing that request. And when they insert this into the SMST, it allows the tree to efficiently calculate the entire sum or the entire cost, the total compute units of all of the requests in the tree, um, simply by looking at the root hash. So it's a very efficient way of calculating the total work done for a node or a supplier during a session. And this allows us to generate a claim, which is essentially the root hash of the tree, and then also a pseudo random proof, which is um, using this new proof mechanism that we'll talk about on the next slide. So I guess the takeaway of this is that we use the sparse Merkle sum tree, which allows us to not only store um, all of the relays efficiently, but it also allows us to calculate the weight or the total amount of work done by a supplier in that session. So a supplier will have a unique tree per session, and this allows them to basically in their claims say, look, this is how much work I've done, please pay me for it. And then they'll generate the proof, which we'll talk about now. So some of you may be familiar with the claim and proof lifecycle and how it works in Morse. And it works very, very similarly in Shannon. However, the difference is, is that we don't use the IADL tree instead. We use the SMST, which is a lot more efficient for adding things like compute units and so on and so forth. So first we have the claim, which is just the root hash of the tree, and that is submitted on chain. And as it says here, by nature of using the SMST, the root hash includes the total work done or the sum of all the weights of the leaves in the tree or each relay. And then after some time period, a proof is generated using a specific block hash. So there will be a certain window. And then after that window has passed, a block hash um, after that window will be said, uh, will be used to generate a proof using this new proof mechanic that I've called the closest proof. And at a high level, essentially what the closest proof does is it goes through the tree and it finds the leaf with the hash that is the most similar to the one that we've provided. And this is a deterministic function, which essentially means given the same hash and the same tree, it will always give you back the same relay in the end, which is essential for a blockchain to work. We need everything to kind of be deterministic. We can't have like random chance playing into these sort of things. And then we can verify this proof. And essentially, in the verification of this proof, we do two things. First of all, we verify that the claim is valid and that the amount of work done during the session is correct. So verifying the proof also verifies that the um, sum of the SMST is correct. And it means that the supplier will be able to be paid fairly um, proportional, to, proportional to the sum of their SMST. And then we also verify that the request, uh, the request and response that we receive in this proof is valid. And if that's a valid proof, because this is like a pseudo random function, you don't know the hash prior to finishing and closing, entering your tree and submitting your claim, you're unable to place a like fake relay at the place where you expect the, um, at the place where you expect the uh, closest proof function to reveal. So essentially we verify in a single function that yes, the claim is valid, and it's valid for X amount of compute units. And then we also val validate in the same, at the same time that the, uh, 
that the tree contains valid relays by verifying their signatures. So this got a bit technical. I'm sorry for that, but um, this logic is still under active development, like the note here at the bottom says. The claim and proof lifecycle, the main takeaway is that the SMST is essential for it to work. We have these new innovations, this new proof mechanic, this new um, bath muckle sum tree. Both of these are the first of their kind. I really, it's, a, um, it's been a labor of love to create things that have never really existed before. Um, and it's amazing to see their adoption outside of Popped. So if we take a step back from what we're doing in Shannon, we can see the SMST being useful in proof of reserves, where we can stay for, for certain that the total amount, so the sum of the tree, is definitely correct. And we can prove that your balance, your part of this tree, is is definitely accounted for in our calculation and um a lot of work has been put into this stuff a lot of uh code and time and hours has been put into it and it's it's nice to see that the innovation that we do here at POCT is being recognized and and adopted not only at POCT but slowly but surely outside of pocket and um eventually we're going to become the uh groundbreaking innovators that everyone in our community knows that we are, but everyone else is going to start to see that as well. So I think this has been quite a short but sweet overview of the claim and proof lifecycle as well as the SMST and, and the SMT in general. Um, but if you wanted to find out more, and um, there is a well-documented repository of information in the SMT repo itself, mm -hmm. Um, which has got all of the diagrams and, and code snippets and links to each and every part. Uh, it's also got a lot of benchmarks as well. So you can see how the SMT performs. I did a rudimentary benchmark and uh, tested it without the actual size of a request and response. Um, however, it seems that the SMT could fit really about like if with our current amount of suppliers, so about like 19,000 nodes, we could handle about 4 trillion requests a day uh, using the SMT. Take that with a pinch of salt because of it, I wasn't counting for the actual size of the requests and responses, but it's a, uh, from that we can see it's a very efficient tree implementation and we're in the work of getting it audited to make sure that the new features that we've added are secure at the like lowest levels so that we can really rely on them. Um, that being said, we went over things at quite a high level. Um, we touched on a few different bases. So if anybody has any questions about the SMT, the sparse local sum tree, or the claim and proof lifecycle in general, um, now's the time to ask them. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions uh, and we can uh, go through it. I'll leave a link to this uh, presentation as well as the SMT repo in the chat uh, just now uh, in case anybody wants to go through it on their own time. But yeah, uh, that's it. I hope that this has been a good high level overview of the SMT and how we're using it. I tried not to go too in depth because I would definitely bore you. <laughs> uh, data structures are not the most interesting thing to talk about in demo. So unless you're a developer and really into that sort of thing, um, I think this is the best way to go about uh, learning about it. Yeah, Harry, um, Harry I, thought yeah. Was, I thought it was great. Like, I think you nailed the altitude uh, and I appreciate you bringing it back to like what the actual use of it is here at Pocket. I think like obviously claim and proof and, and supply side like is just uh, something everyone that, that would want to be a supplier just wants to understand how a session uh, works. Um, but, you know, you, you kind of need to understand the protocol call use protocol ultimately. So I think, uh, I think, I think it was great. Um, uh, I think you nailed it. So, uh, appreciate you coming and, um, uh, uh, presenting this today. It was like super cool. I know no, as over pleasure. there, like 
definitely fi trying to figure out how we can turn this into some uh, content marketing material. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, awesome. Um, does anyone have any questions? As I see, did you come off mute? Does that mean you're, you're queuing one up? I did, but then you asked if anybody had any questions, and I don't have any intelligence. Oh, okay. Questions. I was just going to say, yeah, no, that was, um, that was a really awesome session. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Harry for for hosting and yeah, Mateo is absolutely right. I am going to be hitting you up for content. <laughs> yeah, no, I have a um another slide deck that is a lot more detailed with a lot more diagrams and visualizations, but they are um very very technical. So <laughs> I tried to get the essence of them into this one, but maybe we can pull out some some things from that one, yeah, if needed. I will DM. Cool. And and when you were talking about sort of like the upper bounds of what you were, um, your benchmarking sort of revealed, uh, to understand that in relation to claim and proof and, and a session, that means that like within an, a single session that um, this tree is able to support like just amount of realize uh, and data so that as we as pocket maybe moves outside of just thinking about um, blockchains as the source of all data and things and starting to think about um, being able to put pocket on the front of some LLMs and things like that where obviously the um, let's say the payload that would come back is going to be um, much larger uh, would be my my assumption um yes like, so so the um the idea to, here is yeah. that sorry go on no uh, i'll stop there yeah so, so so the idea is that the rudimentary benchmarks that i i made they um didn't take into account the fact that we don't hash values when we are actually using the tree in production and essentially this means that when we get a when we do like a get request from the tree it gives us the actual value and not the hash of the value so as we expand into more and more different services we can imagine that the request to an llm might be extremely long because we need to provide a lot of context right, right however the response might be quite small so what we're storing in the tree will have varying sizes. However, the benefit of using a sparse Merkle tree is that we can store a lot more data compared to just a regular Merkle tree. So it means that in the session, the supplier will be able to, so currently I think it is, it's capped out at about 250,000 relays, which I, I'm not quite mm -hmm. sure where that number come, came from or whether it was a limitation of the IAVL tree at the time. However, that is a very, very like that's incompatible to the amount of relays that someone could do with the sparse mm -hmm. Merkle sum tree as its underlying structure. So the takeaway is that in a session we'll be able to handle a larger quantity of relays and requests. And depending on the size of each uh, re relay request and response, so whether it's just a get get block number request is going to be quite small, whether it's a LLM, it's going to be quite big. It doesn't really matter. All that affects is the amount of storage it takes up on your, the, the supplier's machine or server. So right. in right. essence, the SMT has got no real lower bound um, of data that it can store. The upper bound, it's sort of, a hard to determine number because we have requests of varying sizes. If in fact we were to um, hash values, it would be very easy to calculate the upper bound of like space that a single session would take up on disk. However, that would be uh, that would require a lot more complex logic in the claim and yeah. proof lifecycle. Um, 
which then, we did think about slow uh, the loading. Yeah, and that would also kind of slow the loading down too, right? Because then you have to hash, you have to hash all. You have to hash so actually, the benefit is of the using the SMT is and the lazy loading feature is that once so during the session, all you do is insertion. All you do is is chuck stuff into the tree. You don't really care about it. At the end of the session, <laughs> you as asynchronously flush that to disk. So you you close this, oh, you okay. close the tree. You can no you no longer write to it. And you save everything to to disk, and then after that is when you'll generate the claim. So you'll generate the claim where, as you're flushing it to disk, which is just take the root hash and submit to, that to the chain. And the benefit of lazy loading is that when it comes to the verification part, and you need to to uh, to generate your proof, you only actually load the the bits necessary. So if I go back to mm -hmm. Uh, this di this diagram. So say maybe this one's a better example. Say we wanted to the pseudo random proof generation asked us to prove this node here. So the the uh, the hash one zero node above L three. If it asked us to prove this, um, we would we would not load any of these nodes here on the right we wouldn't we wouldn't load zero zero we wouldn't load zero one we would not load l1 or l2 we wouldn't load l l4 or l3 all we would load is the top hash the hash zero hash one and then the node that we're looking for so essentially we mm -hmm. just we just load the things that we need to be able to rebuild the top hash and the, the logic for oh, this yeah. If we don't go into the technicalities of it, the, the logic for this is yeah. essentially we just load the path down the tree that we're looking for and we ignore everything else. So mm. the, the, that, that's the benefit of this um, lazy loading feature here is that we have this when it comes to the verification step of the claim and proof. We we can we can have a huge tree. A node could have done, I don't know, a billion requests in a session, and then we only need to load like maybe a hundred thousand hashes before we actually load a uh, an actual value. Um, those are numbers off the complete top of my head. Uh, don't take them for certainty, but the the a hundred thousand. I mean, uh, you could actually calculate the. All of the the max numbers with a lot of maths, but um, essentially we have this lazy loading feature that allows us to, when it comes to restoring from the disk and and generating the proof, it's actually very efficient. You no, know, it doesn't matter about the size of the tree. Of course, if you have a large tree, it's going to take longer than if you have a small tree. But we have this feature that allows us to only load the things we need to load and ignore everything else, uh, which is a really uh really really beneficial improvement for our use case and for use every use case in general when you when it comes to restoring a tree awesome. from disk cool awesome thanks harry uh that was great um and hopefully we'll uh we'll have you back when uh we're getting closer to launch time and there's other cool stuff to talk about um yeah, but again, I appreciate you coming and uh, explaining this all to us today. Super informative. Um, cool. So in terms of our like agenda, we've hit the uh, open to anyone that would like to uh, bring anything up section of the call. So we are now to here, floors open. Oh. Uh, check the chat. No, okay. Uh, so I'll leave floor open for a minute or two here, and um, Mm 
All right, if nobody's got anything, then uh, then we can call it. We'll have one more meeting um, before the end of the year. So I think, I think so, because today's the, if that would put us somewhere around the like, yeah, 18th, 19th, it's gonna be close, uh, but uh, I think we'll have this one more and we'll talk about the uh, status of the Morse update um, and then just kind of like set up uh, 2024. All right, if no questions, we can call it an evening or late morning, wherever or whatever else in the world you're calling you're calling in from. <laughs> evening for me. All right, thanks everybody. Um, we'll see you all next time. And hope you guys found Thank this you. informative. Remember, um, you can DM me. Yeah, thanks again, Harry. DM me anytime. Any feedback on the call itself? Anything you heard? You want to follow up on? Just give me a ping. Uh, and then we'll all like look forward to uh, Pop News's uh, <laughs> tweets about what was said today. Um, <laughs> all right, thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Cheers.